I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. Church, you already heard, I want to invite you to 2 Peter chapter 3 as we will close out this series, The Gospel Shaped Life Today, closing out all of this third chapter. I don't know about you, but for me, it's genuinely a daily battle to keep my mind fixed on what is eternal, to not be sucked in to the surface level things and conversations of life, the shallow nature of little frivolous temporal pursuits that don't have any eternal significance and really mean nothing in the grand scheme of all that God is doing, but to fix our mind on what is weighty in who Jesus is and the greatness of his glory. And I think this text in many ways is like a reality check here at the end of 2 Peter 3, as he speaks of the second coming of Christ, and we are invited in joyfully, excitingly, but in the fear of God to recognize his greatness, his power, and his promise that he is coming. I've been praying this week that the Lord would just move you and grow us as a church in the fear of the Lord, just continually, not just today, but every day. But I would encourage you as you hear this, let this text remind you of the weightiness of your king. I want to invite you to stand as we'll read 2 Peter 3 to begin verses 1 through 10. This is the word of God. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved, In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. By the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would so bring a conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment leading us into the truth of the glory of the Son. Jesus Christ. God, you are beyond our comprehension in so many ways. But Lord, we thank you that you are. And we thank you that at the same time, you can be known. You love us. You desire us to reach repentance. You are patient. Thank you, God, for your patience. Lord, would you bless our time together this morning and move us By the power of your word, and I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you're following along this morning in terms of outline, I've 
I've titled our time in this passage, the judge is at the door. And I get that language from the book of James chapter five, which speaks of just the urgency and the imminence of Christ's return. I really want to look at two primary things, broad level that this passage conveys about the Lord and what he promises to do. And then the third is really an application. The first in the first section is just a reminder that Jesus is going to judge the earth. It's a reminder and presses us in to keep our mind fixed on the scripture. The second is that God is patient. He is not slow. He's not confused. He is patient with us. And all of that should lead us to that last section, verses 11 through 18, that we would be holy and that we would get on mission, being about what the Lord is about in saving people from their sin. But let's jump in, chapter three, verse one, as Peter begins to talk against Many who he says are scoffing, as you know, people scoff at this now, but in fact, Jesus will return and he will judge. Verse one, this is now the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved, and both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. So I hope you know that's what I want to happen this morning. It's what Peter wanted to happen is that your mind would be stirred up. What's the topic? Well, we know the whole section it would be stirred up to the realities of what Jesus is promising to do. What he's already promised to do. Verse two, he says that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So he wants us fixated on what the prophets have predicted. And aren't you glad that the prophets' predictions in the Bible aren't like the weatherman's predictions for this weekend? Okay, that's good news. It's not those kind of predictions. These are certain predictions. These are foretellings based on inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But he says he wants us to remember the predictions of the prophets, the commandment of the Lord Jesus and Savior through your apostles. What ought we to be fixed on? It is the scripture. He says, I want you to remember the scripture and I want your mind stirred up about the realities of Jesus and his second coming. Why? Because here's what you need to know. Verse three, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers, We don't use that word a lot. A lot of people don't, especially if you're a young person. You probably don't just walk around saying scoffer on a daily basis. I don't know about you. Mockers, people who take light, these things, that's what it means. It's kind of make fun of, that's the connotation. Scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Here's what Peter's saying. I want you to remember the scripture because scoffers are going to be loud. Those who mock this and this this reality of what's coming are going to act like you are absolutely crazy. The people are going to act like you at times are out of your minds. And even confessing Christians who may give lip service to the truth that Jesus is coming may even at times tell you, hey, you're being a little too extreme about the way that you're applying this if you practically submit yourself to it, because it's an uncomfortable truth, but it's the truth nonetheless. Knowing this, scoffers will come in the last day scoffing. He says, keep your mind fixed on the scripture because cultural pressure is always going to be trying to press you towards what is temporal, what is surface level. But Peter draws us in. He wants us to have in all things an eternal perspective. He wants eternity burned in our eyelids because we've so invested ourselves in what the Lord has said. And what are people going to say? What is gonna kind of be the argument? I think that's what he says in verse four. They will say, where's the promise of his coming? If he says he's gonna do it, why hadn't he done it yet? Maybe if you grew up, some of the environments that I did, you might've heard somebody say one time, he ain't gonna do nothing about it. What are you gonna do? That's the attitude towards God Almighty. You're not gonna do anything. There's a fearfulness to this text of what he's communicating. And I don't think it's just something that's vocalized audibly. I think this is, an attitude of the heart, because especially with the restraint in the Bible Belt South that a lot of times often exist, we wouldn't say this out loud, but maybe you're living like it. 
Maybe you would never say, God's not going to judge my sin, but the pattern of your life would say, that's exactly what you believe. Do you tremble at his word? When we're speaking of the second coming of Christ and that he's gonna return and he's gonna come, as this text says, like a thief, does it make you tremble a little bit? Isaiah 66 says, the Lord says through Isaiah, this is the one to whom I will look, the one who is humble and contrite and trembles at my word. Are we trembling before his word? Are we kind of just kind of letting it pass by and all this is merely just kind of an abstraction in our minds? Something, a set of doctrines that we need to ascribe to and not a certain thing that is coming personally. Where is the promise of his coming? And this is the argument that will be made. For ever since The fathers fell asleep. All things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So a lot of time has passed. Basically, Peter says will be the argument. And everything has been, since the world existed, uniform throughout history. Basically, what people will say is God has not intervened in the past. Therefore, God will not intervene in the future. But to make the assertion that God has not intervened in the past, what exactly do we have to deny to make that assertion? You have to deny this. What he just said, remember the predictions of the holy prophets, the Lord and Savior, through your apostles, there has to be a denial of the scripture. That's why it's such a big deal if you ever hear someone say, hey, you know, I I think the Bible is an incredible book. It reveals to us so much about who God is, but not everything in it is historically accurate. You need to run. You need to say no. And this is God's word. And where there is a denial of the historical validity of the scripture, there is likely an intentional cognitive dissonance that is being promoted to the second coming of his judgment. If I can create an idea in my head that God's not intervened in the past, I can pretty well convince myself that he's not gonna do something in the future but we know he will. And that's what Peter goes on to say in verse five. He says, they deliberately overlook this fact. So if anyone is taking light the judgment of God or mocking at the judgment of God, he says, there is a deliberate overlooking that's taking place. Notice it doesn't say there is an intellectual struggle to receive the facts. Because a denial of the scripture is never simply a matter of the intellect. What Peter says is there is a deliberately a deliberate intention to overlook it and not to embrace it. It's a rebellion against what God has spoken. They deliberately overlook this fact. And he really draws out, I think, three things that I wanna share right here. And it all has to do with creation. They deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago, the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Heavens existed long ago, the earth was formed out of water, through water. First, this is a creation argument. <clears throat> He's saying, God has intervened, and the most significant of his interventions was the fact that he made us. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God has made all things. I would consider that a pretty serious intervention, that if he didn't intervene and speak, that we wouldn't exist. That's, that's intervention. It's why, again, if you hear in modern philosophy or in some of the scientific disciplines that somebody makes a claim that the universe has always existed or that the universe or matter is eternal or that matter has always existed, that's more than a claim of facts. It's a rejection of creation. He says further, the heavens existed long ago, the earth was formed through, out of water, through water by the word of God. So that again brings us to Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But remember the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. That God didn't just intervene by creating all things that exist. And he just kind of created the matter and everything somehow by happenstance assembled itself into a harmonious structure for life to exist. That when God created all things, it was in a state of disorder originally. I think so just so he could show us that this doesn't just come together. The earth was out form, it was without form, it was void, it was in chaos. And what did the Lord do by the spirit and through him speaking, through him intervening, 
He brought everything into a position of harmony, stabilization, and structure, and natural law, and so that it could be fit for life. And that same structure is existing and upholding this room, and upholding your heart, and upholding your breath, and upholding the very laws of gravity in this very moment, because Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, Jesus is upholding it by the word of his power. He doesn't just intervene at creation. He's intervening every single moment for life. And then he says this, that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Deluged means flooded. Again, not a word we typically used. The means of the world that that then existed was deluged with water and perished. He directs our attention to understand this claim that God has not done something in the past and not only unfounded, it's unfounded with respect to judgment. God has judged the world in the past. And we look to the book of Genesis and we have seen it taking place very, very clearly that God flooded the world, global flood, and destroyed everything with the breath of life, except for those with Noah who he had placed his grace upon in the ark. God has judged in the past. He has intervened in the past. And that was just like a prototype, okay? That's just a foreshadowing. That's the small picture of what's coming. And so please, again, don't think it's coincidental or it's accidental when there is what? A denial of the flood and of the ark as historical events. It's not merely an intellectual claim. It's a claim about the nature of truth and what God's done. But what can we count on? By the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up, not for water, not for flood, because God promised, right? He wouldn't do that again. He wouldn't judge the earth in that way but for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. I wanna obey what Peter says in this text and I want us to do it. I wanna read from a prophet, I wanna read from Jesus and I wanna read from an apostle. Look at Isaiah 66 on the screen. You don't have to flip here. This is Isaiah writing even before Christ's birth. Behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger in fury and his rebuke with flames of fire, for by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh and those slain by the Lord shall be many. Listen to the words of Jesus. In verse 26, he says in this context, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the son of man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Listen to the words of the Apostle John, verse 11, Revelation 20. In his vision, it says, I saw a great white throne and him who is seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I want you to hear my heart this morning. This is not about fear-mongering, or emotionalism, this is about what God says and what we are invited to know and be warned about. You have heard his word. You have heard the predictions. You have heard what he has said. Is this real to you? Do you believe this? I'm not asking, do you ascribe to this and say, oh yeah, but no, it's like, is this personal? Are you ready for this? Is your name in his book? It's his book. Only he can put it there. It's the Lamb's book. Yet he invites us in. Look at this good news. In the midst of all this heaviness, Peter reminds us of the goodness and the patience and the salvation of the Lord. That's exactly what he's about to start talking about is God's patience, not his slowness, 
It's not a bluff, anything that he says. He says, verse eight, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. I believe Peter invites us to think about the nature of who God is and who we are. We are created. He is creator. Our existence and our lives are dependent. He is self-existent. His existence, his being is not contingent upon anyone. Psalm 90, from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. There is none other beside them. We have our being in him. He is not confined by space and time. He has created time. He, does he declare the end from the beginning? Absolutely. Is he decreed all things? Absolutely. Is he confined by it? No, he's transcendent. But does he get within time? Absolutely. He took on flesh. The mystery of the greatness of Christ. But I think what Peter's communicating is this. God can do in one moment, one second, more than any of us could do in a thousand lifetimes. Yet at the same time, a thousand years are but a moment to him. And whether it is a single second or whether it is 2,000 years, the Lord in his omniscience knows every single detail, every single motivation, every single thought of every single human heart simultaneously. So I think what Peter's trying to say is, let's not be so presumptuous to make judgments about the character of God and the word of God based on our finite and frail perception of the passing of time. And it's very good news that he, in some ways, has not come yet, isn't it? Some ways we long, but in some ways we say, Lord, save Some of you could say in this room, I'm so glad he didn't come five years ago. You ever think about this? We ought not mistake God's patience for inactivity. He's active. He's doing a work and he's not delaying and he's not slow. It's right on time. It's right on time because hear this, all of this heaviness, I want you to hear the desire of the king. Verse nine, the Lord is not slow. So don't call him slow. Don't act like the Lord's dragging his feet. Don't accuse the Lord that he's like bluffing about this. He's not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness, but oh man, he is patient toward you. I want you to say that to yourself right now. I want you to say in your inner being, he's patient toward me. He is patient toward you. He's patient towards me. Why? (laughs) Not wishing that any should perish. He's patient towards you. He does not desire you to perish. He does not desire your neighbor to perish. He does not desire your coworker to perish. He is patient towards you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. What's that mean? It means he desires all people to reach repentance. Oh, his love for you. Oh, his patience for you. And his timing is as such because he's still, even today, maybe you need to be invited into this to say, this patience is for me. I'm not surrendered to the Lord. This patience is still for my neighbor. They haven't surrendered to the Lord, but I have the message by which they can be saved. He is patient toward us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And has this not been dramatically evidenced that he does not desire us to perish And the reality is even revealed in John chapter three, verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Do you believe that? 
He's patient towards you and me. Thank God he is patient with us, that he's patient with me. Is this not the strongest evidence? If somebody's questioning divine intervention, is the cross of Jesus Christ not strong enough evidence? That God took on flesh, that's an intervention. That's an incarnation. He took on flesh so that we could know him, so we could know how great his love is for us. That's why he came, to demonstrate his grace, to demonstrate his mercy, to come into Jerusalem, riding on that donkey to make a statement about who he was as king. He is a king who has come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He has intervened. His love has been made evident in this, in This, the cross, God has demonstrated his love for us. It's proven, it's perfect, it's finished. And in the cross, not only is his intervention clear, but I think more than anywhere else in history, it's evidence that God does indeed judge the wicked. Just look at the cross. That's what it's about. It's about the justice of God laid on the one who had no sin. God's justice has been made manifestly evident in the fact that he sent his son to bear the wrath for us. Because you can count on this. Every single person in this room, your sin will be paid for. Everyone in this room, everyone in this world, their sin will be paid for. And the question is, are we gonna pay it? Because that payment is never ending. It's an eternal debt that you and I cannot satisfy Yet the beauty of Jesus Christ, the eternal son, sacrificed in a single offering, his life was sufficient to pay in a single death what we can't pay in an eternity. That's what Christ has accomplished. He loves you. He desires you reach repentance. He desires those around you reach repentance. We need only open our mouths and share of what he's done. I wanna encourage you even now, maybe you're, you, you, you're just squirming right now and you say, I, I need Jesus right now. Well, then receive him. He invites you now to believe in his work, that he paid your debt, that he paid for sin. Believe in him. He's patient towards you. He loves you. He desires you to come to him. But then again, in reminder, Peter says this. There's an urgency because in verse 10, it says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. That's not positive, right? If you're not ready for this, it's gonna be as if you were slumbering in your house only to be awakened in horror with a thief breaking down your door to destroy. He is patient towards you because I want you to understand. I want we to understand for the sake, not just of us in this room, but for the sake of the mission of God, for the sake of the proclamation of the gospel to all those who do not know Christ, that God extends his grace. But once this moment happens, it will not matter matter how intensely a person begged for mercy. There will be none. But the scripture would show that even when Christ returns, those who are in rebellion against him will not beg for his mercy because they will still hate him and not desire him. Jesus is coming like a thief, but let's be clear, he's not a thief. He's not coming to take what doesn't belong to him. He's coming to take what does. We belong to him. This is his creation. And listen to this. When he comes, it says the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies, this is a really interesting phrase because it has like a a meaning of like the elemental particles of the universe, okay? Heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. When Jesus returns, his glory is going to be so great that the atmosphere is going to melt. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Our hearts will be laid bare before him. Every 
temporal little silly thing that we've been trifling with, wasting our time, giving ourselves to things that have zero significance that are drawing us away from the sun. It is all gonna be borne out at the weight of his glory and we are going to cry out, it was not worth it. Every sin, every sin in the, in the dark, hidden, it's gonna be laid bare, it's gonna be exposed. And the question is, in that moment, when he returns, will we be found in, yes, a fear of him, but an excitement and a joy? Because all but imperfectly, we have sought him. And in many ways, what has been exposed is the hidden things we did in righteousness, because those things will be exposed. And those things will be rewarded. And the Lord will draw out those things for his glory. Is that how well we will, we will receive the king? Or when the king comes, as the author of Hebrews 11 says, because of our rebellion against him, we will be found shrinking back. Because we're not ready for that. The earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Jesus is coming. Certainly, he is going to judge the earth, yet he's patient. He invites us into his grace in order that all of this heaviness of his glory would not be understood primarily from a position of simply fear, but a fear that leads us into such a love that he has for us and a peace to walk with him, to know him, to be amazed by him, to belong to him, to be empowered by him, to be blessed by him, to have his favor, to be at peace with him, to share it with others, to experience his goodness, to experience creation to the greatest extent. That's what his patience is for. It's to experience in union with him his goodness towards you. But knowing his coming, what do we do? I summed it up this way. We need to be holy and we need to get on mission. Verse 11 says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? There's a lot of things you can devote your life to that are gonna burn up. But he says, this is the pursuit. What ought the people should we be in lives of holiness and godliness waiting for, I love this, hastening the coming day of God. Hastening it. That means speeding it up. That's crazy, right? Because I, you know, I believe God's sovereignty that he has declared the end from the beginning that all things are in his timing and under his hand. Yeah, but at the same time, that he just said we can affect it. Explain that, I can't do it. There's a mystery and attention right there. I'm just telling you what it says. Are you ready for him to come? Let's get rolling, man. We can hasten the day. Like what kind of people, if I know, I, I can in some finite way, in humility, affect the way that God responds to his coming. Like, let's go. Let's be holy. Let's be godly. Because why? Again, how many times is Peter going to talk about fire? Because the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved. The heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. He's talking about it three times in this passage. Three times. It's because I don't, it's because I don't know about you. I'm really slow, okay? I'm really slow I to learn things. I'm really stubborn. And so Peter has to tell me three times, all this is going to burn up. And what will it have been worth? He tells us again and again and again because, he, you know, because we forget. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens, new earth in which righteousness dwells. Jesus will bring judgment, but it's because he's bringing new creation. You long for this? You understand that all the, the, the brokenness and the discontentment and the dissatisfaction in your life is all like by the grace of God, an opportunity to be leveraged into the truth that the Lord is gonna make all things new and we're just waiting on that. No more mourning, no more tears, no more sadness, no more presence of sin, no more conflict, no more strife, no more war, no more hatred. 
No more brokenness. We need to be holy. We need to be set apart. And there's only one way you become holy. And it's not through by, it's not by your actions. It's by the power of Christ. We are set apart because we've been in Christ's presence. And can I just plead with you right now? Whatever you have to do, starting this moment, starting today, to give everything to say, Jesus, just change me. Jesus, just minister to me. Jesus, I want to depend upon you. Jesus, I want all that you have to offer. Jesus, I want to give everything to you. Jesus, do whatever it takes to transform my life. Jesus, do whatever it takes to transform my children. Jesus, do whatever it takes to bring restoration and healing in my marriage. Jesus, do whatever it takes to embolden me to share the gospel. Jesus, I'm here and to lay yourself out fully before the Lord and to ask him to do it. Only he can do it, but he will do it. I want you to do it. Be holy and godly. And what are we doing in the process of this? We're on mission because as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter five, knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing we're gonna stand, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians five, we're gonna stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We persuade others. This is our mission. We exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. There's a million side hustles we could be a part of, but that's what we're about. We're about the cross of Jesus Christ, the patience of God, reconciling sinners to himself through faith in his work. And the question is this week, who are you gonna give this message to? Because he's coming like a thief and people don't know him yet the Lord is patient and the Lord, we know his desire. So many people are asking like, what's the will of God? Well, the will of God's right here. The will of God is for us to boldly share who Jesus is and what he's done. And I know right now, that you're thinking what I'm thinking all the time. This person's about to think I'm insane. Well, that's what he said would happen. You know, most of the time people don't though, but sometimes people will. And I would say if nobody ever acts like you're in like extreme, if, if nobody ever acts like you're taking this too serious, you're probably not taking it serious. Be holy, we persuade others. And listen to this final charge. I'm just gonna read through it. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this before, and take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. I wanted to read this, not just because it's the end of the letter, but here's what Peter leaves us with. Don't take your eyes off of the prize. Do not take your eyes off Jesus. Do not take your eyes off the scripture. People everywhere are gonna twist it. They're gonna make it about a billion things. They're gonna lessen its significance. But he says, don't do it. Don't lose your own stability, but grow, verse 18, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, would you make us aware this morning of these truths by the power of your spirit. We cannot see them on our own, Lord. We desperately need you to reveal them. We need you to convict our hearts, Lord. So would you do that? Even in these moments, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are patient with us, that you do love us, that we do deserve all, Lord, of your judgment, but you desire to give us mercy. Lord, would we share that message, Lord, and I pray it in Jesus' name.